So my name is Mary. As Dermot says, I'm a cyber psychologist and research fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons. So just want to, at the Institute of Leadership, wanted to welcome everybody to the gathering. We have a big uh, delegation in from Jordan. So, Barhaba, Salam Alaikum, Yihalla, Nibahib al Jordan. Masal Nurha, Nurha, Badin. So, basically, the presentation I'm going to take you through, because I work with police and I work with police intelligence, there's a limit to how much I can discuss in a public forum especially when I'm being recorded, <laughs> so <laughs> just bear with me. I'd like to give you a flavour of, of what my research is about. The Cyber Psychology Research Centre that um, Dermot referred to will be opening on the 4th of October, so we'll be doing more uh, detailed analysis of um, our, our future work at the centre. If you want to come to that event, uh, you can talk to me afterwards. So basically, what is cyber psychology? It's an emerging field within applied psychology. We study the impact of technology on human behavior. The focus is on internet psychology, but the internet is becoming ref less relevant. You know, we won't be talking about the internet in five years' time. We'll just be talking about technology because a lot of activity is happening offline, so to speak, in terms of device-to-device uh, -device communication. But we also look at other technologies, virtual environments, artificial intelligence, gaming, digital convergence, mobile telephones, and networking devices. So I like this clip. You know, people think that online offenders are the only people who actually um, get together and syndicate online. I found this company who are actually offering um, training, warning about the dangers of, of psychopathy online. And, uh, but there's some element of truth in it, in that what we see is in every sort of abnormal psychology or deviant group, there tends to be some sort of virtual forum uh, online to support them. And that's interesting when we think about it in terms of everything that we know in terms of researching a psychologist is based on real world metrics. But if you now take the law of proximity and domain out of the equation and look at people syndicating to find each other online, I think going forward we're going to see different instances incidences in the general population of specific conditions, but that's something we'll be looking at in the research centre. So we've seen an explosion in information technologies, you know, of course you've got to look at all the positive aspects of technology, we are essentially at our research centre, we're pro-technology, but certainly there are risks. Our research area, we look at cyberbullying, online sex offending, and technology facilitated human trafficking. So there's a lot of interest in cyberspace at the moment, and psychologists in particular are interested in this area, cognitive, social, educational, organizational, uh, clinical, and experimental psychologists. We find that there's increasingly an interest in this area. The big question, I suppose, in terms of the psychology of cyberspace is that Will traditional, real-world psychological concepts and theories be sufficient to actually look at uh, investigation in this area? Will we need to modify existing theories, or will we need to develop new ones? So in my own research area, I look at youth behavioral escalation online. The last thing that I'm going to do is sit down in a real-world focus group and talk to minors with permission of their parents, because how close are you going to get to the truth? So really, what you want to do is look at virtual research methodologies. Of course, you have to, from an ethics point of view, have permissions in place. But really, what you want to see is you want the participant that you're studying actually immersed in the environment and then closer to actually manifesting some of the behaviors that they would manifest in that environment. So arguably, knowledge from traditional psychology may not be sufficient, apology to any <laughs> psychologists in the room, but this is a question of a constant process of education. We need to broaden scientific investigation, and as scholars join together in crystallizing new ideas and conquering this very new and very exciting research frontier. So I'm tight on time here, and Dermot will be on my case if I go over, so excuse me if I go a little fast, but I just want to touch on a couple of uh, different areas. In terms of sort of real world and virtual behaviors, what we see is very different types of behaviors manifesting in cyber environments. And 
you know, state and trait characteristics associated be with those behaviors. So there's a whole body of research in cyber psychology that looks at actually isolating these variables and understanding them. So anonymity, we're all familiar with that. Altruism, positive aspect of online uh, uh, behavior. Online disinhibition effect, Professor John Suller, great researcher in this area, and I'd recommend anybody who's interested in online disinhibition to look at his papers, 2004 paper. Self-presentation online. This is a very interesting argument in terms of, you know, we talk about studying youth in this area. You know, very often, and it's interesting, comes up in focus uh, groups that youth will say that the person they are in the real world, there's somebody different online. So you've got this incredibly carefully managed persona online. The person who has loads of friends, is always doing exciting things, is always going out. That person who sits at home and nobody's talking to or hasn't washed their hair or wearing their makeup, you don't see that person project it online. And that ties back into cyberbullying. If, from a youth perspective, that is the optimum person you can be, this online presence, and, and, and that presence is attacked, then how devastating might that be? And is that then associated with some of the you know, consequences that we see in terms of extreme cyberbullying? So we talked about cyber presence, cyber immersion, intermittent reinforcement um, aspects of technology, internet privacy, paradox, again, any of these premises you can look them up or you can come to our, our session on the 4th and actually we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a greater treatment of them. And then internet use disorder, IUD, as uh, designated by DSM. So they didn't accept uh, internet uh, addiction, I think a lack of biological evidence for the condition was one of, one of the primary um, reasons behind that. So now we've got internet use disorder. So I want to talk just a little bit about IA, not AI. AI is artificial intelligence. IA is intelligence amplification. So one of the great uh, thinkers in the area of cyber psychology, a professor called Licklider, in 1960 wrote a brilliant paper and was called Man-Computer Symbiosis. And he talked about the symbiotic relationship between man and machine. And this essentially is the essence of cyber psychology, the you know, technology and humans coming together. We constantly need to consider, in terms of dealing with technology, what we call factoring in the human. And I say that from a technology perspective, because if you think about the type of um, people who are actually designing technology, you know, we very much it's about what technology can do and introducing programs or applications just because you can without really thinking about the behavioral implications of that. I was at the Microsoft uh, Research uh, Faculty Seminar last year and a great speaker spoke, uh, stood up and she spoke about the absolute lack of females, you know, paucity of females working in the area of technology and, um, and what a pity this is. And she pointed out that from a female perspective, we've worked so hard for real world uh, freedoms and liberation that we're going to end up uh, populating a world almost entirely designed by men. <laughs> So in terms of usability interface design, we need to think about, when I think about technology, basically it's designed to be rewarding, engaging, and seductive for normal populations. Did anybody really think about deviant, abnormal, and vulnerable population and the impact of aspects of technology on those underlying conditions? But the point about technology, it in itself is not good or bad. It simply <coughs> mediates human behavior. We have to think of technology as a tool. However, from a behavioral perspective, what we do see is that wherever technology impacts on an underlying uh, condition, we tend to see the behavior amplified and accelerated online, just from a pure forensic perspective. So in terms of virtual behavioral profiling, what do we do? Um, it's quite similar to forensic science in a real world context. Forensic science is the physical behavior at a, a crime scene. Forensic psychology focuses on the, um, the, the, the 
sorry, forensic science is the physical evidence at a crime scene. Forensic psychology deals with the behavioral evidence at a crime scene, what we call the blood spatter of the mind. My area, which is forensic cyber psychology, looks at behavior manifested in a virtual context. So effectively, we look at tracing behavior. And this is all centers on criminal activity. One thing to remember is that Locard's exchange principle is the basic premise of forensic science, and it dictates that every contact leaves a trace. So I've been standing at the podium here, my fingerprints are here. So you can see that I was actually in the room standing here. And the same thing happens online. Every contact leaves a trace. The problem is, to John's point earlier, there's just too much data. So everything is available, but how do you find the relevant data? So this is a model in terms of actually looking at um, uh, offending online. So you've victim, motive, you've characteristics of the criminal. You have their MO, how do they like to operate. You look at the digital forensic evidence, and out of that you make a deductive uh, cyber profile. I just want to touch on the White House project, and again it's restricted in terms of what I can discuss publicly, but the, the White House did a, a call for proposals in this area, and it's a testament to, to our education system here that Ireland is a centre of excellence in cyber psychology. We have undergraduate programmes, we have master's programmes, and we have doctoral programmes. And this is now recognised you know, on, a, on a global scale. And when the White House were looking at this area, they came all the way to Ireland to pick a cyber psychologist from Ireland to go and work on their academic team. And it was an incredible experience working on the team. I worked with network scientists from MIT and Harvard. And it was a great combination of you know, cyber psychology based um, analytic skills coming in contact with network science analytic skills. So one of the things we did, how am I doing for time, okay? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry, one minute. One of the things that we did was um, we were looking at uh, evidence for human trafficking and looking at, at uh, technology facilitated human trafficking. So in the US, domestic human trafficking is a big problem and that's effectively young girls, you know, back in the day, your disillusioned 14-year-old from Ohio jumped on a train and went to Central Station and effectively was recruited or not into sort of, you know, various activities by the people who hung around there. Now we see vulnerable population being recruited online. So a young person expressing vulnerability like, I hate my family, I hate my parents, or actually, you know, per, uh, uh, posting um, uh, promiscuous or, or indecent images online can actually be picked up by these what we call sophisticated cyber actors who then befriend them, build a relationship and may recruit them into, into uh, basically criminal activity. <coughs> so in terms of human trafficking you have legitimate, well <laughs> almost legitimate, online classified websites that are used for placing escort ads so adults over 18 offering various escort services. And it has been established that these online classified sites are also used to traffic minors. So effectively, we started looking at it from a big data point of view and looking at the images. There is a fantastic research archive available through the Wayback Machine, which was an initiative of actually um, archiving contemporary data so that it wouldn't be lost. It was a US Senate initiative. And it provides a, a very rich corpus for longitudinal uh, data. So effectively here on the screen, you can see a timeline there. So from 2004 to 2014, this is one particular website. I'm not going to give you the name of the website, but it's a website. And you can see the, the blue circles are the scrapable data, where the archive went in and captured all that data from that period. The average number of postings on online classified websites, for escorts in particular, are about 20,000 a day. So you can do the numbers to think about looking at these images basically over time. <coughs> what we did was we constructed algorithmic and heuristical um, an algorithmic and heuristical approach to actually analyzing the data, looking at the images, and looking for what we call detectable morphology within the images. 
So this was done as a test to basically see could we detect um, morphologies within the images and we found out that we could. The next project that we'll be looking at will actually be um, looking at human trafficking around the Super Bowl and then refining the measure that we're using and actually looking at analysing images in and around that. So in the particular study that we did and we were presenting for the White House, we were looking for detectable morphology in and around velocity, volume and the variety of this data. And these were effectively hotspots that we picked up. They were also, uh, <laughs> turns out, the swing states in terms of government elections. <laughs> we're like, okay. <laughs> so we haven't actually, um, we're, we're, we're analyzing that. <laughs> so just, right. So just to, 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 to wrap up, I work um, with Interpol, I work with the Met, with the Australian Federal Police and with LAPD, and our primary concern is the protection of children online. NECMEC, which is the National Centre for Missing and Exploited uh, Children, has a database of 90 million images that require investigation, and these are minors and these are criminal, um, these, are, these are crime scenes, effectively, each one of these images. And they have classified and analysed 5,133 of them. And that's why we need to focus on this area and look at machine intelligence, robust decision engineering to amplify effort, or else we are never going to get on top of the problem. So we want to look at applying uh, analytics in terms of virtual behaviour pro profiling of actors. We call actors, it doesn't mean Hollywood actor, it's just it's a network science uh, depiction of a, of, a, of a person in cyberspace. We want to look at degrading, pertur perturbing and observing. We want to look at digital deterrence protocols, in other words, to actually deter people, criminal from engaging in this activity and you need machine intelligence to do that and also we want to look at digital outreach to victims in this space again um, machine intelligence is useful there we want to look at predicting future trending if you are dealing with problems at the moment. There's a great um, metaphor in network science uh, where they talk about big data and looking at technology and they make a comparison to crossing a dual carriageway, to crossing a, a major road. And they say that when you're looking at real-time data and you capture it and then you analyse it after the fact, the equivalent is taking a photograph of traffic on a highway, putting the photograph in your pocket and then actually crossing the road based on the photograph that you took 10 minutes ago <laughs> and presuming that there's not going to be any traffic because there's no point in looking at this data after the fact. So for, as scientists, we have to consider how we're going to get not only on the data in terms of a contemporary context, a temporal context, but also ahead of the data in terms of predicting future evolutions. We want to disseminate this uh, intelligence to law enforcement in um, the appropriate jurisdictions. And we want to use big data to move towards making big decisions <coughs> via big insights. And Mayenberger has a, a great premise that, that, that he's writing about at the moment, where he talks about moving towards the spirit of N equals all. And again, as, as researchers and scientists, you know, sampling is a Victorian construct, basically. And it was, the, it was, it was conceptualized because of the, the impossibility of looking at all the data simultaneously. So we are now with technology looking at, actually looking at N equals all. Although the network science guys tell me, well, it's actually N equals all minus one multiplied by, I said, okay, fair enough. As a premise, we'll go with N equals all. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time.